Hi everybody, welcome to our vodcast on earthquakes. Now earthquakes are sudden and violent shaking of the ground that can sometimes cause extensive damage to certain areas. So in this vodcast, what we're going to talk about is where earthquakes happen and the mechanics behind why they happen. So let's get started. On this slide here, we have two pictures. We have a picture of earthquake locations, and then we have a picture of plate boundaries. And on the left, if you take a look at the world map of earthquake locations, you'll notice that those red dots are all over the place. Now, those red dots are marked locations of earthquakes that we've recorded. So as you can see, we've recorded a lot of them. So earthquakes are pretty common. Now, if you take a look at the pattern in which these earthquake locations form, you'll notice that they make out specific shapes. Now, if you take those shapes and you compare them to the image on the right, our plate boundaries pictures, what you'll notice is that our earthquake locations seem to draw out the outlines of our plates that we have on the Earth's lithosphere. And there's no coincidence behind that. The reason why our earthquake locations kind of draw out our tectonic plates is because our earthquakes mainly occur at or near tectonic plate boundaries. And the reason why this happens is because as we learned back in the theory of tectonic plate lesson, our lithospheric tectonic plates float and move on the asthenosphere. So because these plates move around, the plates tend to get stuck and the rocks build up stress and then slip. So let's take a look at why this happens. Now in this picture here, we have a picture of a divergent boundary. This is actually a rift valley that you could see in Iceland. Iceland is actually a volcanic island that formed on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And as we learned in seafloor spreading, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is where two tectonic plates move away from one another because of seafloor spreading. So this is actually a divergent boundary. You can be on two different plates on the same day uh, just by crossing this little opening here. Now, the reason why earthquakes happen is because our tectonic plates move and they tend to get stuck. And the reason why they get stuck is because if you take a look at the edges of the plates here, they're not exactly smooth and flat. So unlike these two plates that tend to move away from one another, because it's a divergent boundary, you have transformed boundaries that slip past one another that will get stuck on each other. And then you have convergent boundaries, which the plates collide with one another and these rocks are going to get stuck. So again, here's another example of a tectonic plate boundary. This is the San Andreas fault line that runs through California. So one plate is going to slip past another one because this is a transform boundary. And as you saw in the previous picture, the edges of the plates are not going to be smooth and flat. So they're not going to slip past each other easy. They're jagged and sharp and irregular in surface shape. So they're going to get caught on one another, build up strain, stress, and then break and slip. So let's take a look at the mechanics behind how an actual earthquake happens. Now, when you take a look at how an earthquake happens, there's three things that you need to know about. You need to know the words deformation, elastic limit, and elastic rebound. And what we'll do is we'll basically use this popsicle stick example in the upper right hand corner to discuss how an earthquake works. Deformation, first of all, you need to know that deformation is basically a change in the shape of the plate. So when the plates get stuck and they continue to move and push, they build up stress and then they change their shape. Now, as they build up stress, the rock is only going to be able to withstand so much stress before it breaks. It's kind of like inflating a balloon. You can only put so much air into the balloon before the latex in the balloon breaks and pops. So your elastic limit is the maximum amount of stress that the rock can withstand before the rock breaks and then slips. So earthquakes are going to happen when you exceed this limit, when there is more force applied to the rock than it can hold. And then lastly, the energy from the earthquake gets released in a process called elastic rebound. Elastic rebound occurs once the plate slips and the rock goes back to its original shape and when it snaps back into its original shape, that's when the earthquake waves are released. So let's take a look at how this happens. Now, up in the corner here, we have two ladies with popsicle sticks. So as we know, a popsicle stick, when it's left alone and we just find one, it's usually flat and straight. So what this lady has done is she has applied stress or strain, just like stuck plates would do. All right, so she's taken her hands and she's applied force on the opposite ends of the popsicle stick, causing the stick to curve and to bend. Because of the motion of her hands and the strain that she's placing on this popsicle stick, she has now deformed the popsicle stick because it's now curved. And this woman here is going to continue to bend it 
and continue to increase the force until it reaches a limit. That would be the elastic limit. And when she exceeds that elastic limit, the popsicle stick is going to break. So there's only so much force that this popsicle stick can withstand before it snaps into two. When the popsicle stick breaks, then the stick is going to undergo elastic rebound. And what happens is, when we break the popsicle stick into two, you'll notice that the two pieces are no longer curved, they're flat. So they snap back into their flat shapes that they had originally, and as a result, they released energy. And the energy that they release is sound energy, and that's the snap that you hear. Now, earthquakes work the same exact way. So let's take a look at that. Okay, in this diagram here, we have tectonic plates. We have two plates here, all right? They're going to be moving in opposite directions. And where two tectonic plates meet and the break in the rock where they meet is called a fault. So if you take a look at the edges, the edges are nice and straight. They're not deformed yet. But as the plates move and the stress builds up, they deform the edges and they become curved. And eventually these rocks are going to exceed their elastic limit. There's going to be too much force and they're going to break and slip. When they break and slip, what you'll notice is that the edges have now gone back to their original shape, their straight edges. So they've rebounded back. When they rebound back, the earthquake is then releasing the seismic energy that's going to travel through the earth. And that seismic energy is shown right here. So this energy is going to travel through the earth, causing the ground to shake and possibly whatever damage is going to follow that. So that's how an earthquake happens. We have plates moving in opposite directions, we deform the rock, we exceed the elastic limit causing the rock to break, and when it slips, the rock returns to its original shape releasing energy. So let's take a look at fault lines, which are the locations at which earthquakes do occur. Okay, so faults. Faults are breaks in the crust where tectonic plates meet and earthquakes happen. Now, faults have two walls to them. They have two halves. They have what's called a foot wall and they have what's called a hanging wall. And you have to know the direction or the movement of the hanging wall to understand the three types of faults that we have. The normal fault, reverse fault, and strike slip fault. So there are our two walls. One way you can remember is this. The foot wall is usually a wider base, so it's easier to rest your foot on it. You can't really rest your foot on this narrow base here. And the hanging wall is usually wider at the top, so you can kind of hang from it, hence the name hanging wall. Now, the faults that we have down here are caused by different types of forces or stresses or strains. And they're very similar, or they're exactly the same as the three boundaries that you learned about. So, one third of the battle is already won. So let's talk about our normal fault first. Now, the tectonic plate boundary that a normal fault occurs at is called the divergent boundary because as you can see, the plates are moving away from one another. So as a result, because the plates are moving away, the type of force that's being put on this fault is called tension. You can think about tension just like as if you were playing tug of war. You have two teams on two ends of the ropes, and before the whistle's blown, the rope's really loose and laying on the sand, but when the two teams pull on the ropes at the same time, that rope pops up and it gets really tight, and then we wait for one team to pull harder than the other ones. So that force that you see on the rope that causes it to get really tight is called tension. And as a result of tension, what happens is the hanging wall, the wall with the wider top and the narrow bottom, slides down the fault, and this causes a normal fault. Now, if you could just remember what a normal fault is, the reverse fault is exactly what it sounds like. It's the reverse. So the opposite of a divergent boundary is a convergent boundary because we have our plates colliding with one another. And then the force type is not tension, but the opposite of tension, which is compression. I always remember compression by remembering the word press. And when you press on something, usually two things have to meet in order to press on it. So if you press on a key, your finger has to push against a keyboard key on the computer in order for it to work. So compression is when two things come together and as a result the hanging wall motion is moving up the fault. So that compression force forces the hanging wall to slide up and again we have the wide top narrow bottom here showing the hanging wall. So as a result we have sliding up with the hanging wall. Now our strike slip fault just like the transform boundary because that's what it is, the transform boundary, is a little bit different from the other two. 
since there's no hanging wall on the transform boundary, there is no hanging wall motion. It's just that the plates are going to slip past one another, just like a transform boundary. And then the force type is going to be a shearing type. Now, the way I remember this is because I look at these as like blades on scissors because you might have heard scissors called shears before and when the scissor blades close to cut paper or cut whatever it is that it's cutting the blades don't close on top of one another the blades actually slip past one another the shears do that which helps me to remember that this is shearing force because the plates slipping past one another kind of look like the shear blades slipping past one another okay and that's all we have for our faults here so that concludes our vodcast on earthquakes. Now they start. Thank you for your time. I hope you found that helpful.